Okay, so this is a big issue. Um, you know, we've talked about angels before when we went into Revelation, and we talked about the, the, some of the roles of angels. This is a different approach to it, um, and one of the reasons we're talking about this is because there's a huge New Age movement, both within the church and outside the church, where people are uh, acknowledging angels as important in their lives, uh, to the point of even maybe worshiping them. So angel worship has become a big deal in the United States. I know that um, Janine's uh, son, uh, his girlfriend is a big angel worshiper. And uh, she praised Who's, who's Janine? Janine is my sister. And, okay. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, her son is, uh, one of her sons is dating a gal that is a huge angel worshiper. And, um, and that is just big now. Um, and so we're going to be talking about that. This first quote is from Kenneth Copeland, who is kind of a new age Christian name it and claim it kind of guy. And I just wanted to start out with reading that. He said, quote, your words give your angels charge to pros go prosper you. Um, or to, uh, let's see, I can't see this here. Or to fold their hands and step back. When you confess the word of God over a situation, you put your angels to work. If you speak faith words enforced by God's word, to bring about what you want to come to pass and he quotes psalm 103 20 which doesn't say anything like that so this is the new age so the big thing with new age is is the actuation of your own authority to make god or angels step in and fetch it for you that's basically it it uh, doesn't recognize god's sovereignty in our lives both the new age uh, is an actuation actuation of you stepping into the universe and when you step into the universe, providence basically follows you. You, you actually make God a step in and fetch and servant of yours as you do angels. And this is exactly what Kenneth Copeland is teaching. And uh, we're going to take a look at that. So we're going to look at angels and their dealings with man. And the first thing we want to point out is that what Kenneth Copeland says is not true. God controls the actions of angels. Uh, yeah. So go to Psalm 91, 10 through 12. Can you define what you mean by God's sovereignty before you begin? Yeah, God's God has control over everything that happens. You know, I mean, when you know, he even says to the point that when you die, it's appointed for you to die. You know, um, you actually don't die of cancer. You actually don't die of malnutrition. You actually don't die of dehydration. You die because it's a God ordained event. And uh, every man has an appointment with God, and that, according to uh, Hebrews. And uh, whatever it is that you're dying of is uh, God sovereign over that or over, over that death. And so, you, you know, God isn't like surprised when you come to heaven. It's like, oh, my gosh, we didn't know you were coming. You know, it's it's uh, it's on the door. Yeah. door it's all ordained. It's all sovereign. God is in control of all events or he wouldn't be God. Yeah. And so all of it filters through his will. And it's there's a lot more complex than that. Our choices certainly filter through his will. But uh and but we are still responsible for the choices we make. So um, even though we're you know we're all prone towards sin, uh, you know as Christians we do have choices not to sin, unlike the unnatural man which chooses to sin, uh, you know, as far as the motivation is concerned. So um, we have choices to make when we're uh, worshiping God and dealing with God in, in all areas of our life. God gives us the power to refuse to sin and to do His will. Uh, through his Holy Spirit. Um, so we go to Psalm 91, 10 through 12. And someone just go ahead and uh, if you're there, just read it. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra. The young lion and serpent you will trample down. Keep going. Okay, and this is done as a result of God. Yeah, that's good. Uh, as a result of God's angels, that he causes the, all those things to give you that kind of strength through his, through his angels, which he gives charge concerning you. And this is, of course, speaking of, of, about believers. And this is, of course, a passage that Satan uh, tempted Jesus with, this passage. He basically said, hey, why don't you just jump off the temple? Because it says in Psalm 90 that he will give, give his angels charge concerning you so that you, uh, your foot does not strike against the stone. You know, asking them to, you know, jump off the building. 
And of course, this passage doesn't apply to that because uh, Jesus wasn't just willy-nilly doing whatever he wanted for some stupid reason, uh, just to jump off a building. Um, and that, and and Satan knew that that uh, was a self would be a selfish request just to show his might and power uh, for no no particular reason. That's also one of the reasons that we reject many of the false gospels because they have Jesus performing things like he's a magician, you know, creating birds and. Uh, and doing all this stuff, showing his power, he pushed down a little boy in the Gospel of Thomas and killed him, you know, just to show he was powerful. So those are obviously things that are not, that, that are miraculous things that don't give Jesus the ability to do whatever he wanted, actually. He did things in accordance with the will of God and all of his miracles and everything was in accordance with God's sovereignty uh, and while he was on the planet. Uh, he certainly can act uh, and I don't think he even acts independently now. I think uh, he, when he created the world, uh, God uh, basically uh, ordained that and was uh, basically uh, actuated uh, the power for Jesus to create the world. So even there, Jesus was in submission to the Father in the Godhead, uh, even though he's uh, deity. So God controls these actions. Let's go to Hebrews 1. It actually gives a specific overall uh, definition of what angels do, uh, what they were ordained to do. And then if you go to Hebrews uh, chapter one, it discusses angels in detail because it wanted to make clear that Jesus was higher than the angels. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Okay, so he says right here that angels are ministering spirits. They're, de they're designed to minister in our lives. I don't know exactly what that means. Uh, when, what, when what ways do they minister? You know, um, so it's hard to exactly know that uh, even when it says, you know, even when Jesus was tempted, uh, which I don't have in here. What's the Greek word for, did you look up ministering here, used here? Ministering just means to uh, assist and comfort. That's it. Um, to, to, uh, to comfort us, to minister to us, to, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go into any more detail than that. We really can't use the normal word of what ministry is as far as man on man, because uh, we just, you know, we have no idea all we can glean from it as we go through the discussions what that type of ministering is. We have examples of angels ministering to man that we're going to go into. So we'll take a look at that. Um, and the next thing is that they test men and have ordained discussions with man. So if you go to Hebrews 13, um, it basically discusses that Hebrews 13, one through two. Um, but love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for, for uh, by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. I've always thought that I've always thought like, I think I've even told you guys before that when you go out, you never know, you might be, you, you might be, face to face with an angel at some point, we should always, I mean, if we thought like that, then we would be nice to everybody, wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, and the purpose of them talking to you is specifically to see if you're gonna show them hospitality. Yeah. Yeah, but what is like the narrative of our society is stay clear of strangers, don't help anybody because they could kill you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know, angels are messengers. The word angel means messenger. So when you get to messages of, to men, we're not going to read the passages of the birth announcement, both of Jesus and John. But the, in those birth announcements, there's a lot of specific information given to angels uh, give, to give to men. And then, of course, uh, I got, you know, somebody got in a discussion the other day. I was talking with a friend of mine who was... Uh, going through Hebrews chapter one with a bunch of people. And the woman said, you know, you never talk to angels. Don't talk to angels. You know, you're not supposed to talk to them. And the issue is, well, if God ordains it, you are supposed to talk to them. Uh, you're not supposed to call upon an angel to talk to one. 
You're not supposed to communicate on your own to angels, but if they talk to you, it is certainly okay to communicate with angels. But from the standpoint of, uh, of angels communicating information, uh, the information always has to be according to the will of God. You know, angels can, you know, you can have an evil angel uh, give messages uh, in which angels give messages in exorcisms. Certainly evil angels and demons speak to men when they're uh, possessing them and they can take over their bodies and speak messages out, out of their bodies. Certainly angels can do that. So keep in mind that evil angels and regular angels basically have the same powers. There are no, you know, good angels do not have more power than evil angels. They have equal powers. And, um, and God, you know, created it that way. Go to Galatians 1.8. Then we just read Galatians 1, 8, 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have, we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Hello, Moroni. The angel <laughs> Moroni preached a different gospel that the Mormons receive uh, and claim to be an angel from heaven. And right here, Paul says, if anyone's to preach a different message than what you have received. So an angel is never going to give you a different message. Even if it was ordained by God, an angel would never speak anything and give you new revelation that's different than what we've already received, which just never happened. And of course, we have this same thing happening uh, in the Catholic Church, where people will see visions or visions of Mary, uh, or people who have died, or angels who come and give them some message that's contrary to what we've already received in the scripture. You're not going to get new revelation from any angel that's different than what God has already commanded in the scripture. If you get any communication from an angel, it's not going to compromise anything uh, that's in God's, God's word, regardless of what they tell you to do or what they're talking to you about. The next thing is, that men are never supposed to condemn any kind of angel. This may seem obvious, but I'm going to give you some examples as to what's happening, especially in our, with our charismatic friends uh, in relation to angels and condemning angels. Go to Jude chapter 1. What do you mean what's happening? What is happening? I'm going to give you an example after we read this. Okay. Jude, uh, Jude uh, chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things, they are destroyed. Woe okay, to them. that's good. So this is basically saying that men who come into the body of Christ, who are false prophets, uh, they reject authority and they revile angelic majesties. <laughs> In other words, they're saying things about angels or demons and taking authority over them. But an the example he uses is that even Michael, the archangel, who's the most powerful angel there is, when he disputed with the devil over and argued over the body of Moses, he did not dare pronounce a judgment against him. He, he, he knew that he could not rot, revile angelic majesties, that he still had to respect them. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is I was in a, one of my friends who uh, really loves the Lord, by the way, uh, when she prays. She um, makes fun of Satan. She, she uh, reviles him. Uh, she speaks directly to him um, in her prayers. And, and I warned her not to do that. I just said, look, you, you cannot, you can ask God to bind Satan. You can't call him names, uh, you know, in your prayers. And you can't revile him. You know, he has authority and uh, you are uh, beneath that authority and you are to respect that authority. 
by basically baiting him and going after him, you're actually inviting him into your life. When you go beyond the authority that scripture gives you to do that by actually reviling him and going after him and taunting him, taunting, taunting him. Yeah. You are basically opening yourself up to demonic, uh, you know, possession, okay. demonic attack. You know, who wants to uh, go after Satan? You know, the whole point, whole point is to keep him away from you, not to make him angry at you and then have God go to him and say, Hey, this person is taunting me and doesn't have any respect for me. Um, what if I, uh, why don't you give me a, give you a shot at him? It might just be granted. Ugh. So, you know, I just wanted to point that out since we're talking about angels, uh, you know, that, that, that demons have authority equal to other angels and they have the battles going on according to Ephesians chapter six in heaven over specific territory. We don't know what that's about, but it's happening all around us. And there are battles in heavenly places uh, between principles and the Bible calls strongholds. And we have no idea what that's about. So territory is certainly important. And Satan made that very, very clear when he talked about taking uh, the territory he owned and giving it to Christ if he would just bow down and worship him. So the territory and the, the uh, strongholds of the land are an important part of the demonic world. We just don't know what it's all about. But uh, they definitely like to take control of territory. And one of the ways that they do that is when people have demonic things in their homes uh, and uh, symbols of demonic things and invites them to come in and take control of that, that residence or that land or whatever. So uh, a, a interesting symbolism to what men want on earth of like power and influence, which is also taking other people's territory. Yeah. Yeah. And this is interesting. Um, all of the, all of the, um, when people die, whether they go to hell or to heaven, um, all transportation from this world to the next is accomplished by angels. You know that? There's you know, when my, um, when my, uh, she wasn't my biological sister, but she was my, she, I grew up with her. She was, she had down syndrome when she died. I mean, she was down syndrome and, and then she got Alzheimer's go figure. Um, but literally when she was dying, you could feel her being ushered into heaven. It was, it was just this incredible uh, you could feel the holiness that surrounded and it it you could feel her being ushered in it was it was beautiful and i mean so when you say that angels usher us in when we die i 100 percent believe that because i i felt like that's what was happening or she went from seizure to seizure to looking up and smiling and then leaving right yeah. So somebody go to Matthew 13 and we look at this talking about transportation to uh, out of this world, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Jesus explains it in Matthew 13, starting in verse 38. Someone just read verse 38 through 41. Okay. Uh, and the field, oh wait, verse 38. Yeah. Um, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Going to what? 41. 41. Uh, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out all of his kingdom, all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them to the furnace of fire in the place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah. So even the casting into hell is done by who? Angels. Angels. And transportation to heaven. Go to Matthew 24, verse 29 through 31. Matthew 24, what again, Ralph? 29. Uh, 
29 through 31. Matthew 24. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and the sun sign of the son of man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with the power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from the end of the sky to the other. The angels are going to grab every single believer and deliver them to heaven. Woohoo! Well, each will have his own angel. So that's how many. Yeah, own personal escort? That's yeah. what I'm talking about, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I get a white horse too. Yeah. Me too. I found out my personal angel's name. It's Harry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and that's also one of the strong evidences. When I did the uh, message on the rapture, um, this is how the rapture, the rapture actually happens just before the end. This gathers every saint just as Jesus is returning. It's, it's not something that happens at the beginning of the tribulation. And if I attach all these scriptures together, you'll actually see that uh, from the time that the judgments come upon the earth to the time that the rapture takes place is very quick. They're not, they're not separate. They're not three years apart. They're not seven years apart. They're immediate. Uh, and Revelation makes that clear too. These are immediate uh, when, I mean, the people are going up to heaven while the bowls are right as the bowls are being poured out upon the earth. If you take a close look at Revelation, and I mean, you might you might even be able to feel the heat as we are being raptured going up. And that's a whole nother study. I've done a study on that. I've gone to specifics about how I really do believe that the rapture is just before the end uh, of the tribulation and not at the beginning. And um, that has been something uh, the, those scriptures have been. Um, maligned and one of the scriptures they use to prove that point is that you know uh, for you know believers are not subject to wrath but keep in mind that all the events of the tribulation are done by men upon men uh, the first six the last bulls are when God pours out his judgment directly upon the planet so the first six trumpets uh, are not God's wrath is not going not killing any believer so that has destroyed that particular passage. That's the main passage they use saying, oh, well, we're not going through the tribulation because, you know, God's going to spare wrath of his children. Well, God, God protects believers. No one dies as a result of that wrath. Uh, people who convert in the middle of tribulation are certainly killed by the Antichrist, but they're not killed by God. And they're not, they're not affected by his direct wrath uh, that is poured out upon the earth. Um, God has dispatched angels for children to specifically protect them. Very interesting passage. Go to Matthew 18. That is like, before even reading it, just listening to that is very encouraging. Because I worry about that. I'm sorry, say it again, you broke up. Oh, I was just saying that's encouraging to think about. Yeah, let's look at this for a moment. I'm going to give you a real life story. You need to watch this movie after I explain how this verse was actuated in this movie. It'll blow you away. So someone read uh, verses uh, 9 through 10 of Matthew, Matthew um, 18. Um, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. It says right there, I say to you that their angels, they have specific angels designated them. And we're not talking about just uh, uh, believing children. God protects all children, believe, believing and unbelieving. He has protects them. They all have their angels. There's a movie called uh, The Cokeville Miracle. 
The Miracle of Cokeville, one of those, you can get it on Netflix. Um, it's a true story about a man and his wife who went into a school in Cokeville. Uh, they gathered a hundred and something kids into a room. They had a bomb. This bomb uh, was, uh, he detonated on, before he went into this room, he practiced on a school bus and it completely, completely destroyed the school bus to where there were only like sizes of metal that were as big as a tire and be completely torn apart. He takes it into this schoolroom and um, all the kids are in close proximity to the schoolroom where this bomb is. He has to go to the bathroom and when he leaves, he puts his wife in charge of the bomb. She accidentally detonates the bomb within feet of these children and not one child died. Uh, the investigators came, the bomb exploded up through the ceiling even though it was designed to blow specifically sideways. And they couldn't explain it. They interviewed the children and asked them what happened. And the majority of the children they spoke to said that there was a person in the room guiding them to the windows. Uh, there were people that no one could identify that they said were guiding them that were dressed in white. And, um, and several children, they actually have the children at the end, the real children in the movie where they interview them. And they say, yeah, I was told by this person to go over here and I was told to do this. They were given specific instructions that basically protected them. Uh, there were angels in that room. And so basically um, not one child died. Both the perpetrators died, the husband and the wife. And um, it's an amazing story, a miracle at Cokeville. Uh, it was also a Mormon community. So there weren't a lot of, you know, these were children that were protected by God, specifically by angels, regardless of the faith that they had. So it's a pretty miraculous event. But also, one of the investigators who doesn't believe in God uh, identified the bomb, and he said that there was a wire cut, and it was a fresh cut. They couldn't explain how this wire got cut. They interviewed everybody. He the, the guy, the perpetrator didn't cut it. His wife didn't cut it, but there was a, a one of the wires was cut that would have detonated it to like three or four times its detonation power. I need and to see that movie. I can't explain it. Yeah. There's an interview of that. Uh, there's a whole interview online between him and a reporter who's trying to debunk the whole thing. And the guy says, look, it can't be explained. There's all kinds of evidence on this particular deal that we can't explain. What, no, what did, did, did those, uh, uh, most of those children end up being believers as adults? Um, some of them already were. Um, many others just attributed to all the angels protecting them. And we don't know specifically why God decided to intervene in this particular yeah. area. It was, you know, children five through 10, you know, and God just was not going to let it happen. So, you know, this kind of thing happens, I'm sure, all the time. And, um, you know, I was just watching uh, something the other day about the miraculous, uh, uh, just, you know, how Israel almost got destroyed in the 1973 war. It's called, it's a, it's a documentary called Against All Odds. It's about how Israel should not have uh, survived any of these wars. Obviously there were angels involved. This one particular event, these men had to get to the Golan Heights. They were being attacked by these tanks and they needed to get through. And they ran into a minefield, which slowed them completely down. They weren't able to get through and they needed to get through in order to breach this you know, hole that had happened in the 1973 war. Well, as they were trying to go through the field to dig up these mines, this amazing wind came for like 20 seconds, like 60, 70 mile an hour winds. And when it stopped, it blew all the dirt off all the mines so they could see where all the mines were. And uh, the wind never came back. It only was a 60 or 70 mile an hour wind for like 20 seconds. And then it was completely calm. And they were able to walk through the minefield because it blew all the dirt off the mines. So it's pretty amazing stuff, you know, uh, you know, whether that was a miraculous thing by God or by angels or whatever. Um, it's interesting that Psalms, uh, there's a verse in Psalms that calls angels the wind. So I don't know, could have been the angels in the wind. We don't really know exactly what happened there. And then, of course, we have the situation where angels can actually assist men. Uh, go to Acts chapter 5. This is all through Acts, by the way. 
Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Someone just read that. But the high priest rose up along with all of his associates, associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now, when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the Senate of the sons of Israel and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. And they returned and reported back saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors. But when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to, to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the okay. captain, oh, oh, go ahead, stop. Um, yeah, so notice here too, remember we talked about, you know, whenever the, I didn't, I didn't bring up any of the passages in the Old Testament when it says the angel of the Lord. Because that, you know, the angel of the Lord is specifically Jesus Christ. When it says the angel of the Lord or the angel of God. Notice here that it doesn't call this angel the angel of the Lord. It says an angel of the Lord. So it's specifically an angel. It doesn't go to mean. Acts, Yeah. Go to Acts chapter 8 verses 25 to 36. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the, uh, to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Canaan's queen of Ethiopians who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit, this angel, said to him, the, there is no capital uh, S in the Greek, so this can't be the Holy Spirit. It's got to be consistent with the passage that it is a, the spirit, this angel. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. He said, you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of scripture that he was reading was, he was led as a sheep to slaughter as a lamb before a shear is silent. He did not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate to his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered and said, please tell me, of whom did this prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And they went along the road, and they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I, uh, and he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down to the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him. But when he was rejoicing, but Philip saw himself in Exodus, and he passed through and kept preaching the gospel. So angels are, are, are doing transportation. That's uh, a trip. And that's not the only place people are transported in Acts by angels. Notice that God's not doing this. He's dispatching angels to do all these miraculous things. And when he does the miraculous, it's either through angels or through men. God and Jesus Christ does not do it. It's angels. But Man. It says here, though, it's not an, like an, a spirit of the Lord. It's the spirit of the Lord. So wouldn't that be Jesus? Uh, I don't know exactly. Um, I do think within the context of the passage, um, it's possible that it could be the Holy Spirit. But I really do believe that uh, there's no other passages where the Holy Spirit actually deals with men like this. It's always angels. And God specifically says that it's angels that minister and it's angels that he gives charge over. 
and it's angels according to Psalms that do these things. So if, even if the spirit was directing it, I really do believe that it's angels that actually do the actions. Yeah, but in that particular one, wouldn't that be Jesus Christ, though? Because he is referred to the spirit of the Lord. Uh, it's possible. Although the spirit of, uh, you know, this, it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, the seven spirits of the Lord are also referred to in Revelation, where it actually calls them the spirits of the Lord. And there's seven of them, and they're all, they're angels. Mm. So it's really hard to say specifically. I wonder what the word is used. Is it, is it actually spirit, or is it like angel? Like, is, I want to see like the the greek translation of the word spirit um you know we could look that i'll look that up later but the spirit the word for spirit in the in the uh in in the new testament is always the same it's the word pneuma so it's this it's the, the context is used of angels and it's the holy spirit so you can't you know it's hard to be dogmatic on this uh it's possible to say that it's the spirit but the holy spirit does does not normally deal with men specifically in a miraculous way this would be one of the few times if that's true. Normally, angels are dispatched to do these things. So I don't know. I, I have to just say I don't know here. Go to Acts 12. Acts 12, 1 through 12, 1 through 11. Now about the time here, the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread when he had seized him. He put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all of the Jewish people were and all the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate. Because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in the front gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, is this, is it, is it his angel? But continue, Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Okay, so notice it says, they say, that this is his angel. This is his specific angel, is their, is their conclusion. But also, keep in mind that although it's obviously an angel that did this, uh, Peter says um, that he described to them how the Lord had led them out of prison. Was it the Lord that led him out of prison? No, it was an angel. Obviously, the Lord directed the angel to do that. So that might shed some light on whether it's actually the Holy Spirit who transported them or whether it was uh, basically actuated by the Holy Spirit or actuated by the Lord to have an angel specifically do the task. And of course, angels assist with battles. Go to Daniel chapter 10. This is a very, very interesting passage of scripture. Um, I don't really understand it, but it kind of, it, it, it kind of blessed me. Go to Daniel chapter 10. 
You only kind of got a blessing. <laughs> what did you say? I said you only kind of got a blessing. Kind of. So <laughs> start in. Um, start with uh, verse seven. You ready? Go ahead. Okay, ten. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, I, a great dread fell upon them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly par uh, paler, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words. As soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. <laughs> Still going. Oh, then, then behold, a hand touched me and set me, and set me trembling on my hands and knees and said to me, O oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now, or for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. Okay. Now, if you go back further in the passage... It basically describes what this, who this person is. Um, this personal this, angel. <laughs> this angel, yeah. Verse five, it says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen. The waist was girded with the belt of pure gold. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning, and his eyes were like flaming torches. His arms <laughs> and like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. That sounds like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus that is sounds crazy. What? Can you imagine seeing that? I you're, you're drowning out. I said, can you imagine seeing that? No, I can't imagine it. So Natalie, is there someone sitting next to you? Yeah, Kyson is here. Hello. Oh my gosh, you just freaked me out. Oh, I'm like, is that your personal angel I'm seeing right now? <laughs> <laughs> we got one more tonight. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that just kind of tripped me out. I'm looking and I'm listening, looking at you talking. I'm like, what is that? Who? What is <laughs> next to Natalie? <laughs> so, here's why I'm so freaked out about this passage. I'm like, is really confident that this person is like described as Jesus is described in Revelation chapter one, but then he's saying to Daniel, um. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is probably Satan or some high ranking demon, was withstanding me for 21 days. This person, this this angel uh, was in this angel's face or Jesus's face for 21 days. And he wasn't able to withstand him and had to call upon Michael to come help him. So I'm looking at this and going. This gives you a lot of idea of how powerful, you know, Satan is when God gives him authority. If he had to call upon Michael to help him uh, to get released from this three-week dilemma. And if this is, I doubt it's Jesus Christ that for that reason, I think Jesus Christ could easily deal with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. But who knows, maybe Jesus was limiting his powers and he was, you know, fighting uh, Satan for three weeks. Look at verse 18. Can you hear me? Uh, it says, then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. Yeah. So it could be an angel. It's hard to say, but the point is they're fighting battles, man. People, their battles are being fought all over the place and angels are fighting them. And in this particular case, he mentioned to Daniel that, hey, man, I, I'm sorry it's delayed, but here's what was going on. And I had to get Michael involved in order to get released. Pretty serious stuff. <laughs> So they administer God's judgment also. Angels administer God's judgment. Go to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation 
For a minute there, Natalie, I thought your angel wore a beanie. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. No, I think a crown would be better. There you go. Angels chapter eight, verses one through ten. <laughs> Angels chapter eight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good book. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna write the book. <laughs> 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 That's what happens. The closer I get to 65, the more these things happen. <laughs> I hear you, Ralph. Okay. 8 verse 10, right? 1 oh, through 10. 10. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out to the angel out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed peals of thunder and sounds of and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And Keep the seven going. angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the earth was burned up and a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and the third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood. Keep going. Yeah. And a, a third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Yeah. So, Who's wheeling these judgments, guys? Angels. Satan. The angels. Wormwood. Wormwood is Satan, right? No. Um, in this particular case, um, uh, Wormwood is compared to Satan, but this is actually just a actual. I've studied this word, and it's actually just a uh, wormwood. Is an actual um, shrub that is completely um, can poison waters. Ugh. Um, so I think that God involves, you know, God is not doing any of these judgments. And, and, you know, the only judgment that's delivered directly by any hand, any, any divine hand is when Jesus Christ fights in the battle of Armageddon, period. Mm -hmm. And um, all the rest of this is administered by angels. And I, you know, so I just asked the question why, you know, I think the reason they're allowed my theory is that this is finally their time to get some justice for all the things that have happened on the planet. They're mm -hmm. getting some, uh, they're letting them get into the fight. Yeah. I can imagine, I can imagine Je Jesus going, go, go, yeah. go, go, go. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, angels, it says in the Bible that angels look upon us and wonder. You know, they're actually, there's no, angels can't have jealousy because if they sin, they fall. Angels are sealed. All the angels that, all the angels that survived after Satan's fall and the third of the angels fell, they were sealed by God, not to sin. Once the choice had been made, God sealed them forever. But angels certainly wonder about these sinful people who are on the planet who have a personal relationship and are filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with the person of Christ uh, and filled with God the Father. The Bible says that all three of them dwell in our bodies. Yeah. But aren't they also, Ralph, or is that not that they're not? So they they not they also know the Holy Spirit, right? No, they don't. No, they're not indwelt by God. They're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They're created spirits that have their own being. Uh, that are dispatched by God as created beings. They don't have an intimate relationship with the Father. Wow. Or the Son. Don't you think they just wonder about us the same way that we wonder about them? They do wonder about it. Yeah, that's you know, what I'm 
saying that they that's probably the same way that we wonder about them because i wonder about angels all the time yeah. yeah but don't they angels want our good no they do they do but they still it says the bible they look upon us with wonder they don't get it they don't understand why we're why such idiots why are you so stupid people well, no, the wonder that they look upon us on is for the great love that God has for us when we're such yeah. sinners and they don't sin. That's yeah. what they wonder about. And then, of course, uh, if you go to, which we won't spend the time to go in these passages of Revelation, because we've already studied this before. But as you know, that uh, when the angels, there's four beings that follow God the Father the, uh, around when his throne is around. And Ezekiel, these four cherubim, and Serebim, which are the highest angels around, guard the throne of God uh, when it has traveled around. In Ezekiel, it traveled around the skies, and these four um, angels protected it. Also, these four angels, which they're called beasts in Revelation 4 and 5, uh, basically administer worship. Whenever they speak, the 24 elders bow down, and all the Persian worship the throne, and the angels always begin the worship. The worship starts with them, and then it, it goes throughout the all of heaven, and they orchestrate worship. The angels do. These, these beasts that, that circle the throne, which are seraphim and cherubim, very powerful angels, control all of the worship uh, from the throne all the way down to us. Every time there is a worship, uh, a, a, a gathering of worship before the throne is orchestrated by these angels. And then, of course, just to make it really clear, the worship of angels is forbidden. Um, which is also, we talked before, remember that study where we talked about the worship of the host of angels? Uh, the worship of the host of heaven is one of the worst things that you can do. And then it's the worship of the host of, of, of heaven that brings forth the, the wrath of God in Revelation. So uh, when you go to uh, Colossians chapter 2, uh, there was a big cult there in Colossae that uh, was worshiping the host of heaven. And if you start in verse uh, 13, it says, when you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of the flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our transgressions, having canceled out certificate of debt um, of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them and through them. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow at what to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, like Moroni, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. It's just interesting through this whole context of the passage, he throws in there, don't worship angels. Um, which is forbidden, you know, and of course, every time angels appeared before man and they fell to the ground, the angel always said, get on your feet, for I'm a fellow servant like you. Don't worship me. So, so basically, we, wish, we shouldn't, even though we have a personal angel, we shouldn't be talking to them? No, but let me say this. I have, since I did this study, I have actually changed the way I pray. I, I, I no other study has caused me to change the way I pray, but you know, I pray now. I basically say, God, um, you know, please put a hedge of protection around this household, my family members, through your angels. Lord, dispatch your angels, give them charge over us, and allow the full might of your angels uh, to protect us, uh, to, uh, to minister to us, uh, for us to recognize their presence when they're around, and to thank you for uh, bringing your angels uh, to the battle with us. Yeah, I personally think I have a, an, an incredible angel by my side. <laughs> I think we go. all do, but I mean, I do think you're, that's right. I mean, just well, as you were going through this, Ralph, I'm thinking, wow, I mean, I, I'm i going to change the way I pray too. Yeah, I mean, God says that he'll give you charge over angels. And just a reminder, I mean, look at the power of this first passage 
that I read of what angels can do. Uh, when you go to Psalm again, uh, this is kind of the premier passage of the power of angels uh, when God dispatches them in your life. Um, if you go to Psalm 91, 10 through 12, um, look, at, look, look at the power of these, uh, that they do. It says, verse 10, this is talking about angels. No evil will befall you. No will any plague come near your tent. You're, you're COVID proof. You can't even get <laughs> COVID. Well, well, if you he, get COVID, you're going to survive it, basically. You're, you're, well, you didn't you didn't pray for an angel to give charge that day. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, verse 11, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Not some, all. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will sit him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Now notice that God, it switches from the angels to God again. That God is the one who does the protection, but he does it through the dispatching of angels. Yeah, yeah he's the dispatcher. And look at all the things those angels do in your life. So ultimately when there's a divine uh something happening you might uh open your eyes a little more to the idea that this might not be some miraculous intervention by god or jesus when prayers answered it actually might be well i would say when prayers answered that's absolutely god doing something uh when like a tumor completely disappears but who knows maybe he's dispatched an angel maybe he's given angels charge in that situation it's something yeah. to think about yeah i'll let me tell you a quick story uh that that happened yeah. since you said that so when i was 19 i was having some uh issues i had just started dating paul and or dad whoever and uh i was having issues so i went to the doctor and they said they found a tumor on my kidney and it was what was happening is it was pressing on my they didn't know if it was benign or cancerous they didn't think it was cancerous but what was happening is it was pressing on my kidneys and it was releasing uh, toxins because anything that's pressing on your kidneys, your kidneys like releases this toxin. So they scheduled for me to have uh, go in and they were going to remove it. And the night before at church, Paul and I were at church and uh, I, they all laid hands on me and prayed for me. Okay. So it was just for uh, surgery that all went well. I mean, I was only 19 and blah, blah, blah. So I went in the next day for my surgery and uh, the doctor had to do an ultrasound to see where he was going. And he stopped and he said, well, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything. It's not there anymore. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, I don't know where it, it's not there. It was there, you know, last month, three weeks ago, but it's completely gone in a situation like that. I mean, I, we gave all the glory to God, of course, but you, it, yeah, I mean, that very well could have been, you know, he, those hands, the angels he put at work, God, whoever, but I mean, all glory goes to God, because he's the dispatcher of it, correct? Yeah, but it, it, what was interesting is, as I kept seeing, I just saw the fingerprints of angels in everything God does. Yeah. And, um, the fact that he allows um, I didn't read, I missed one of the passages of scripture uh, that talks about um, how he specifically has angels take us to heaven, but I wanted to make that clear uh, that um, they're the ushers. Yeah, look at this. This is uh, the rich man Lazarus. Um, I didn't read this passage, but it's Luke chapter 16, and it says, uh, now, there was a rich man named Lazarus, habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously in the splendor of his day, and a poor name named uh, Lazarus. Oh, sorry, his name wasn't Lazarus. Uh, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels. Mm. So, when we die, or whenever anything happens angels are the are, are the uh the wagon they're they're the transportation vehicle and there's something there's something that should give us awe and pause that god is involving angels specifically into these tasks 
and, and, and actually the most important part, uh, you know, in our deaths, that angels are taking care of us in, in the most dramatic part of our lives. The, you know, death is one of the most dramatic things that can happen to you. And there's an angel right there comforting you. Mm-hmm. And I would happen to think that maybe in birth, you know, if you're being guided in your death, how about in your birth? How about coming through that birth canal? That maybe Absolutely. There's an angel there because the scripture says that angels are dispatched, that all children have their angels. So I just started, my mind started going wild with this. Just thinking that, wow, I've been giving a lot of, I haven't been giving um, angels their due based upon how much they care about us and are taking care of us, even though they're dispatched by God to do that. We ultimately owe the glory to God for all of it. We don't give glory to angels, but we certainly recognize their activation in our lives. Yeah. 